where the news comes first. This is KCRA 3 News at 7. We didn't even know we needed to have a conversation about fentanyl. One year after KCRA 3 brought you the story of a 17-year-old Rockland boy who lost his life. She was my only child and she's gone. Hundreds more parents and families in our area have suffered the same fate. It was a Percocet that she had taken half of, not even the whole thing. She had just taken half of, but it was fentanyl. Fentanyl, hidden in counterfeit pills and often sold online. They thought they were taking something and it was actually something else. Even a tiny amount proving deadly. It was unimaginable. Uh, my daughter had no history of drug use. Tonight, in a KCRA 3 special report, how much worse the problem has become in the past year, the new ways the drugs are being disguised, what young people are seeing at school. Pretty much what all the teenagers or young adults my age, that's what they're doing. And how experts say parents should talk with their kids. We have to approach it from communicate and educate. It's never too early to start. Good evening, I'm Brian Heap. Our focus tonight, a shocking rise in deaths in our area caused by fentanyl. Exactly one year ago, KCRA 3 brought you the heartbreaking story of 17-year-old Zachary Didier of Rockland. It's a story we believe has not only raised awareness in the months since, but possibly saved lives. It's also one that has changed how we report these tragedies and the language we use. Zach's story opened our eyes to the fact that this black hole called fentanyl isn't just swallowing those who are addicted to drugs, it's also killing people who don't even know they're taking it. And tonight, we look at how the conversation has evolved over the past year, the education and outreach being done in schools, and ways for parents to start a conversation with their children. We'll also hear directly from some teens who tell us this problem is bigger and runs deeper than you might think. We begin, though, with a club that no parent or sibling ever wants to join, yet whose membership numbers are quickly growing. Every single day in our communities, families are experiencing the pain of losing a loved one to fentanyl. KCRE 3's Jason Marks sat down with two moms who are left only with the memories of their daughters. I said, nope, I'm one and done, just me and Jane. Like you most know. parents. So these are um, my photo albums. Denise Gentile captured every moment. This is her first birthday, her first birthday cake. Of her daughter, Jade English's every accomplishment. One of her first time ice skating <laughs> at the downtown ice skate rink. Each image, precious time between loved ones. And I'm so grateful for all the memories that I got to make with her. That's one huge thing as we did so much together. But these memories are now all she has to hold on to. This was actually her last birthday that I got to spend with her. This is her painful reality. In memory program from her funeral. On an early March morning last year. March 4th is the day that I got the phone call. What followed that family member's call will stick with her the rest of her life. I wanted to call you because Jade's in the hospital and it's not looking good. When Gentile got to the hospital. Nobody had prepared me for what I was walking into. There was Jade on life support. Um, and I just like lost my footing. My, my knees just went completely weak when I saw my daughter laying there. Doctors weren't able to save Jade's life. She was my only child and she's gone. In the days following, Gentile learned Jade was another victim of a growing epidemic. It wasn't until later that I learned that it was a Percocet that she had taken half of, not even the whole thing she had just taken half of, um, but it was fentanyl. My daughter was poisoned to death. She was deceived to death. To this day, mom still doesn't know where the drugs came from. I don't want to relive this every day, but I don't also at the same time want any other family to have to go through this. It's the worst thing in the world. A parent should never outlive their child. Tragedy can also be felt inside yeah. this Valley Springs home. It was unimaginable. Uh, my daughter had no history of drug use ever. January 2nd, 2021. The day mom Lita Rose's phone rang. Her daughter's friend frantic on the other end. I was wondering why was she calling? You know, why wasn't my daughter calling? And she was hysterical and she told me, Jamila's dead, Jamila's dead, I'm serious. And I'm like, what? Jamila Ward was a 39-year-old mother of three. 
She was found dead in her own bed. It was like a kick in the stomach. Like Jade, Jamila thought she was taking Percocet, but no Percocet was found in her system. It was fentanyl. I think about her constantly, every waking moment. She's the first thing I think about when I wake up in the morning. And she's the last thing I think about when I go to bed. And like Gentile, Rose is searching for answers. I want to know where, who she got it from. I want to know exactly what happened to my daughter. She feels as if someone needs to be held accountable. I look at it as if she was murdered because she was murdered because she did not knowingly take fentanyl. When you come here and it's like, this is what I have left of my daughter now. This is the reality for so many mothers here in Northern California. I miss her, I miss her a lot and I wish she was here. A feeling of emptiness that will never go away. And I'm sorry this happened to her. Just trying to find any bit of light in the darkest of days. I'll see her again someday. Jason Marks, KCRA 3 News. Another family who lives with that heartbreak every day are the Didiers. Zachary Didier was a 17-year-old high school senior at Whitney in Rockland, and he was making plans for college with an incredibly bright future ahead. But it all ended because of one pill. Zach was a victim of fentanyl poisoning. He bought what he thought was a Percocet from someone he met through Snapchat. Instead, that dealer sold him a counterfeit pill made with fentanyl. And joining me now are Zach's parents, Chris and Laura Didier. And these are the two people who are most responsible for opening my eyes to this problem. And they have really helped to reshape the way that KCRA3 is covering this epidemic. So it's good to see you both again. Nice it's good to be Brian. here, Brian. So, Laura, I remember about a year ago when you told me the story and you said, Brian, we didn't know and we've got to make sure that other parents know about this. And you both have dedicated your lives over the course of the last year to doing just that. So, Laura, tell me about this journey for the last year. Yes, it was a difficult decision to make because Zach was living this great life and, and you worry about what people are going to think of your child. But we knew Zach so well and we knew he always wanted to help people and he would not want us to uh, become aware of this crisis and not share what we learned. So. We quickly, um, as a family with our other kids, decided to make this our mission and warn other families um, so they don't have to suffer this way. And Chris, I know you and Laura, you go into schools, you do presentations. I've been there for some of these. Um, you do them for parents as well. So mm -hmm. tell me, Chris, how has this been received, especially among the teens? I think it's been received quite well, but I think there's a little bit of trepidation in, in hearing the idea of a parent or an adult wanting to talk to them about a very tricky topic. But when it's a parent, a grieving family that comes into their classroom and we come from a very open perspective and an honest place and to say this is a danger. We're not trying to tell you what to do or what not to do. What we're trying to do is to just explain that there is a danger out there. There's deception behind the danger and your age group is the most impacted right now and we want you alive. We just want you to understand and want you to know. So Laura, what's sort of the next step here in this advocacy movement? Because I know one of the things that you both have, have worked hard on is trying to get the social media platforms to do a little bit more. And they are doing more than they were before. Maybe it's arguable as to whether or not they're doing enough. But what do you think is the next step? It's just continuing to get this message out. Um, I in person, we fi we're finding is working really well. When we can get in front of the kids and they can s hear our story face to face, they can see our concern for them, getting messages, you know, out through social media where the kids are, um, you know, different um, public service announcements that they'll see, you know, where they are. And going into the schools has been, has been really um, eye-opening for them. They're so compassionate, they're so kind, and you can tell it, it's really, the message is really landing. 
And Chris, it's, it's not just the awareness either, because you both have been really involved in the Capitol, going to the Capitol, talking to lawmakers, trying to get new laws passed, something that would stiffen the punishments in, in, for these fentanyl traffickers. And I think it's safe to say it has not gone as well as you would hope. So, so what's your message there, and, and what do you think is next for that? I think that there's an old paradigm that we're struggling with. And in our advocacy, one of our biggest challenges is the stigma that tends to connect with the message that we're saying. And when a new problem, a new complex, the complexity of what fentanyl brings, uh, it's hard to understand people, uh, general people, parents, uh, educators and even lawmakers tend to compartmentalize and think, oh, that's that old problem. But that's, that's a misunderstanding and they're missing the message. We need to get past that and saying this is a different problem. In the past there was a slippery slope when someone would experiment with a product like marijuana or, or heroin or any other kind of uh, illicit product. Um, but now with fentanyl in the play and, and it's you know, made in clandestine labs and they're very lethal, it creates an environment that's more like a minefield and there is no chance to learn life's lessons through a slippery slope of the past. So we, we need to enact new laws to update and implement better safeguards to prevent these senseless deaths. Well, I know when we first met, you both told me that you wanted to honor your son, and you have absolutely done that. And, and real, I wanted to just share with you real quickly a message that I got today. This is from the Placer County District Attorney, Attorney Morgan Geyer, and he told me, this is his quote, Laura and Chris's activism and passion have helped countless other grieving parents and family members through their darkest days, and it continues to be inspirational. So he said it really well. Thank you both for being here tonight. I appreciate it. Thank you, Brian. Thank you, Brian. When we come back, the new forms of fentanyl. Parents may not have seen this, and we want to make sure they're aware. We speak with a deputy district attorney from Stanislaus County about what to watch out for. Welcome back to our special report focused on the prevalence of fentanyl and counterfeit prescription pills. Fentanyl has changed the game for law enforcement. Agencies from the Bay Area to the foothills and up and down the Central Valley are scrambling to get this deadly drug off the street. And they are making big busts. Take a look at this. It's a photo from Galt Police. This is a bag of counterfeit pills that were found in a hotel room earlier this week. Officers say this bag has a whole pound of pills. And listen to this. Police say there's enough fentanyl there to kill up to 227,000 people. 
people. That's because a dose of just two milligrams of, of fentanyl would kill most people. Just yesterday, Modesto police announced that they are looking for this man, Jared McWhorter. Police say he ran from a traffic stop and left behind a stash of 300 pills containing fentanyl. He's wanted for drug charges and for two outstanding drug warrants. And joining us live now is someone who is not shocked by those photos and those stories. Patrick Hogan is a deputy district attorney in Stanislaus County. And Patrick, I know you have a lot of experience with drug and gang cases. And when we talk about fentanyl, though, we're talking about two different things, right? There are the counterfeit pills that are killing people unknowingly. And then we also have people who are drug users who are purposely going out and seeking fentanyl these days. So help our viewers understand, Patrick, just how big this problem is now and how much bigger it's become since COVID. It's such a difficult thing to talk about. I, in our county, the way we like to describe it is we have an overdose crisis and a poisoning crisis. Those things are happening together. We have people who, as you talk about, are seeking fentanyl, they are overdosing, and we have some people who have no idea the drug they're taking. They're being poisoned to death. Um, I talk to law enforcement uh, people and, and every agency in my county, and what they describe is a crisis that they've never seen before. And these are people who are veterans for 20, 25, 30 years. They're seeing deaths the likes of which they've never seen. In our county, we are losing three to four people per week to overdose. So you think of all the challenges out there for law enforcement, right? I mean, they're, they're dealing with violent crime, they're dealing with theft, they're dealing with gangs and the things that are associated with homelessness. But it seems like fentanyl is this common thread weaving its way throughout all of that. Is that true? There's no doubt. Um, what we have seen in our county is between 2019 before the pandemic and now is, is a, just a sea change in the way in which narcotics are operating. Fentanyl is displacing every other drug. Fentanyl is showing up in every single drug. We are testing methamphetamine that's showing with fentanyl. We're testing uh, pills that are showing up with fentanyl. We are seeing fentanyl just put its claws into every part of our society. So right now we're looking at some video. These are the, the what we call the M30 pills. Now you're saying this is still out there on the streets, but this was kind of the big problem a couple of years ago. That's not even the big problem anymore though, right? In 2020, we began to see these pills, these M M30 pills um, on the streets. They are now known as blues. Back in 2020, we had an overdose crisis in Stanislaus County where at the time, and by overdose again, I mean overdose and poisoning where we were losing one to two people a week. And that was shocking to us. Now, the difference is in 2021, we have drug users that are actively seeking those same pills that were poisoning people in 2020 because they are looking for those drugs. They are looking for that high. And we've also got the, um, the, the colored fentanyl that is sort of a new marketing thing. Tell me about it. It's almost a putty like substance. Tell me what this is, why, why people are seeking this out. A few, uh, I think last year in, in, in 2020, we began to see this colored, brightly colored fentanyl. Um, I and other members of law enforcement in my county did an interview with a drug dealer. Uh, who was bringing fentanyl into our county. And what he described is he could go into San Francisco, into the Tenderloin and drive down the street and people would come up to his car and they would say, hey, I've got red. Hey, I've got blue, I've got purple. And that's because they were selling fentanyl in colors. Um, this, uh, the, the photo that you just showed was a bus that was done by the Special Investigations Unit of my county sheriff's department. Um, that is just the most recent example of this brightly colored fentanyl that is really taking over the market. We think it's a marketing gimmick, but it's showing up everywhere now. So Patrick, you've got maybe 20 seconds and we're talking about a drug that is so highly addictive and because of the work that you do, you see this problem through just about every lens possible. What's the most important message that you want our viewers to get tonight? I think to understand that this is something that is completely different. I work with incredibly dedicated law enforcement officers, people who are working day in and day, night, day, day, in and day out to save lives. Um, but what's amazing is, is that no matter how much fentanyl someone is selling, and this is incredible, it doesn't qualify for state prison. That's because in the state of California, someone could be out there selling a poison that's killing people in the thousands, and our legislature views that and our laws view that as a nonviolent offense. Wow. That's shocking to hear. All right, Patrick Hogan, thank you so much. Patrick, for all the work that you're doing with the Stanislaus County District Attorney's Office, we appreciate it. And thank you for covering this. Yeah.
So this problem is growing so quickly. It can be scary for everyone, especially for the parents of teens. And those moms and dads know how difficult it can be to monitor what their children are doing at all times, especially social media. KCRE 3's Melanie Wingo talked with three teenagers from the Sacramento area, and she joins us now with their perspective on this. Melanie? Well, Brian, we wanted to get a sense of what teens and young adults know about fentanyl. So we talked with some teenagers from our area to see what they know about this drug. I had two um, two peers that um, passed away because of um, they thought they were taking something and it was actually something else. The problem that I'm seeing right now is fentanyl and that teens are not aware of the counterfeit pills and how easily something gets laced. So it's clear teenagers are hearing about fentanyl, but the traps some kids may fall into are they underestimate its danger. Some kids may not know they're getting fentanyl if they go on social media looking for pills like ecstasy or painkillers and then end up getting something laced with fentanyl. I could message them for the menu and within maybe anywhere between an hour or two the day, depending on when they're out driving around, I could have it in my doorstep within an hour or two, 24 hours. Even while you're just by yourself, you know, you maybe just be feeling like, hey, I want to try something new, you know, you know, I'm bored. Nothing's really going on for me so well. So, you know, I might as well try, you know, what, what is there to lose? So I think my generation is like really reckless and they just don't care. Or it, it's not going to happen to me because, you know, I've been doing it for so long or I know what I'm doing or I only get it from this one person. OK, so when it comes to how teenagers are talking with their parents about fentanyl, it varies. Some kids have discussed fentanyl specifically with their parents. Others have simply heard about the drug dangers overall. Also, when parents, you know, they, they gave me the talk and it was like, we don't need you to do it now, you know? We need you to stay focused, stay on the right path so you can get to where you need to be at. My mom always tells me, you never know what it could be laced with. You never know. You can smoke for 10 years, and one day you go to smoke and it's laced with something and you're done for. You're the parent, you have the best intention of your kid, you love your kid, but you don't know this world. You weren't raised with social media, especially not Snapchat. And a big reason we continue to cover this topic is to help parents have conversations with their kids about fentanyl. Coming up after the break, my conversation with a family therapist, her thoughts on having meaningful conversations with your teens.
We are back now continuing our conversation about the dangers of fentanyl and Melanie Wingo joins me. So Melanie, just before the break, we heard from some teenagers, got their perspective. What about parents? They might be watching this and wondering, okay, what do I do? How do I approach this? And you talked with an expert today who had some advice. Absolutely. Fentanyl poisoning is a clear and present danger. We have learned that over the months here. Experts say if we leave things to chance when it comes to expressing those dangers to our kids, that can have disastrous consequences. So we talked with Kelly Richardson. She's a licensed psycho psychotherapist with a family therapy practice in Folsom, and she says avoiding talking about all of these dangers can be quite a mistake. We can't fool ourselves into thinking not my kids because good kids still make impulsive bad decisions. Burying our head in the sand, it does nothing to help us and it actually potentially has very dangerous consequences for your child. Now, Richardson says our approach as parents is key. We're here to communicate and educate and it's okay to express empathy letting your kid know you get it experimentation isn't even like what it was when we were kids there's no margin for error we don't want our kids to feel judged and we don't want them to feel punished or condemned we want them to feel like this is an open non-judgmental conversation that we can come back to whenever we need to that they can dip in and share a little bit and dip out and and we want it to be fluid. OK, Melanie, so we want to have the conversation, but how do you even start this? Where do you begin? Well, that is what Richardson says. You don't need to have a timeline on these conversations could be five minutes. They could be 30 minutes and you may not see the return on your investment of this dialogue immediately. Your child could be faced with the pressure to try a drug years and years from now, but they'll remember those talks that you had with them and ultimately it could end up saving their life. Yeah. All right, Melanie, thank you so much. That's really important information. Hopefully, uh, parents took some good notes there. Our coverage continues on the KCRA3 mobile app, and you can scan this QR code right now to see an interactive map. We've put this together, and it shows you just how many fentanyl-related deaths have happened in the state for 2020, and it also shows you the incredible impact on younger people. Thank you for being here with us. Our news at 10 is on at My58 and at 11, back here on 3.